Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm your host, Bob DeMarco. And on the edition uh, today, uh, with me on the podcast is Mike Latham of CollectorKnives.net. Um, when I first went down the traditional knife or slip joint knife rabbit hole a few years back, uh, Mike Latham's CollectorKnives.net, he, he wasn't aware of me at the time, but was a big enabler uh, for this habit. And uh, if you have any proclivities towards collecting, uh, you know that traditional knives are, a, are great fodder because you have a lot of different patterns and you have a lot of different handle materials. And uh, there are so many different ways you can go with a traditional knife collection. And uh, collectorknives.net is a wonderful online purveyor of many different kinds of knives, all different kinds of knives that we all appreciate. But for me, I think of the more traditional knives when I think of that outfit. So uh, in a moment, we will be bringing Mike Latham on um, and uh, speaking with him. But before we do, I just want to mention the Patreon uh, account. We have Patreon. And if you think the things we do here are worth uh, your money as well as your time, please uh, uh, help out the show by donating and being a patron. Kind of like in the old school, if you're a Medici, uh, you, you hired a, uh, a Renaissance artist uh, to, to uh, well, to render you entertainment and to depict your family and that kind of thing. This is kind of a modern version. And I'm not saying I'm Da Vinci or, or, or Michelangelo or anything like that. What I am saying is uh, we have this great new way to patronize the people who are creating things that we like. So if you like what I'm doing and what Jim is doing here, uh, please help us out. So without uh, further ado, uh, I bring you Mike Latham. You're listening to the Knife Junkie podcast. If you've got questions or comments, call the 24-7 Knife Junkie listener line at 724-466-4487. Mr. Latham, Mike, how you doing? Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. Doing good, doing good. How you doing, Bob? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. Well, uh, it's a pleasure to have you on the show. And and uh, you know, if if you heard what I was just saying, I know you mostly uh, for traditional knives and uh, slip joint knives. Uh, when I first got into the hobby of collecting slip joint knives. Uh, as I veered away from tactical knives, not veered away from, but branched off from, um, you were one of the first people I went to. It was you and Derek Bone. And uh, and you, Mike, uh, made a very big impression on me with how uh, with, with your sales videos, how you would open your knives with your thumb. And I thought that that was a thumb on the edge. You would click it all the way forward. And that left a big impression. But really, uh, it's the selection and... Uh, and the obvious love you have for knives and traditional knives that you see on collectorknives.net. So tell me, how did you start this company and and how does it play into your life on the whole? Well, I uh, when I was in high school and growing up, my father owned a feed store. And so the reason it was successful is because he had two boys that could come over and help. So he didn't spend a lot on labor. Uh, but he, I mean, he worked himself to death uh, until we got out of school but we would go over there and then in the winter time, you know, you'd sit around, he'd have a fire going and he'd have a trash can full of peanuts and we would get the locals come in and, uh, you know, they would be uh, talk knives. I mean, that's, we had a guy that owned a pawn shop. We had just two or three guys that sold knives on the side to make a little money and ended up a lot of them. I, I got to see the knives and, and some of them gifted me some knives. And, uh, but the main way I got knives and got started in knives back then was a lot of them ended up having to pay their bills at the store with knives. So they had had several of the old stag uh, case collector sets and things like that. He, he liked them. He wasn't addicted to them or anything like that. But uh, so I went through college, went off, got a real job and then uh, worked through that. That worked out. Uh, phenomenally. I mean, God took care of me on that. And, and then he ended up in 2005, he ended up getting a terminal diagnosis. And so we moved back to help him on the ranch because he was still ranching and uh, really just bored. 
I mean, just looking for something to do. I still had knives. I was still addicted to them. When I had a job in Dallas, I was buying. I was a canoe guy, mainly case canoes. Mm. And so I've got uh, folders and folders of I tried to buy, you know, one of everything. I mean, and I was I was one of the guys that back when eBay started, I would get on there and pay three times what it was worth because I didn't have that knife yet. So uh, that's how I got started. And then and then all 30 or 40 miles from my house, I got introduced to a gentleman who had been a machinist. He was one of these, you know, five foot six tall guys that missing a finger and just as the rest of his fingers were just like steel. And, uh, and he was into knives. Matter of fact, when Jim Parker, you know, I, the story was people, people were giving him grief about having the fighting dog, uh, tanks, tank stamp on the bulldog brand knives. And so, yeah. He went to the to the standing dogs and he called he called my buddy and asked him said hey do you want to buy all my fighting dog stock so so my, my buddy who at the time he was oh probably sixty or so and he he had stock optioned into uh, some money so he bought I don't know at the time it was thirty or forty thousand dollars worth but that went a lot further back then than mm -hmm. it does today but and. And then he just, he liked those so well, he got into hen and roosters and he knew the old, all the old dealers back, back East. He knew, you know, Sargent and Parker and Frank Buster and then some of the less known ones, but they were big volume dealers, uh, Oscar Easley and people like that. And uh, so he just kind of accumulated and I started going over there and then I started accumulating and it's, it's a lot like a, I, I suspect it's probably a lot like drugs. It's uh, I had to start selling <laughs> to support the habits. So. Uh, yeah. Uh, the <clears throat> Yes. Uh, that is something that keeps coming up. It's like, well, knife junkie is in my name, but I, uh, I, I think about that. It's like, you know, there's an anticipation of getting a new knife, but it's also the collecting. You said you're a canoe guy. What is it about the canoe? What is it about traditional knives in general? You said, so you come from Oklahoma, right? Was this yeah. all happening in Oklahoma at the time? Yes. You're young. So a feed store and guys show up and they talk about knives. What is it about knives? You know, why weren't they talking about hammers, screwdrivers, or wrenches? I don't, you know, I don't really know. I think that's just happened to be the crowd that was there at the time. Uh, you know, once you get two or three of them together, then that's what they're going to talk. But I mean, there were there were other things, but they didn't really interest me, and and they couldn't really use them as a commodity to buy to buy their uh, oats. So, yeah, uh, we just I mean, there was there was car people there. I mean, there's you know everything, but uh, I don't you know that's that's one that you're probably asking it because you hadn't heard a good explanation, and I don't have it. I don't know why I got addicted to knives. And, I mean, uh, there's one gentleman come in, and he would come in every all. Oh, maybe every two weeks when he'd catch me in there and he would always have a yellow handle case knife. And mm. back then, I mean, he was probably paying $12 for him or something, but he, he gave me a different one every time he, he caught me there. And, uh, so I ended up with probably, you know, two dozen of the yellow handle knives and, and they just <clears throat> were in a folder with some of the other stuff until I, until we come back, move back to sulfur and, uh, and that, I always enjoyed it. I always loved it, but uh, I had no idea that somebody could get so addicted to it. Well, so you mentioned the yellow handled cases. I have this one and the mini sodbuster close at hand. And what I love about these uh, yellow Delrin cases is that they mean chrome vanadium steel, almost always. I know sometimes they have different additions with stainless, but when you see the yellow Delrin, you know it's going to be that, that uh, chrome vanadium. And I love cases chrome vanadium steel i love that steel yeah. um so you started collector knives.net as a lark it was just something to do how how did you how do you go about accumulating all of this um uh inventory and 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 the, the and and all of the back steam to create a, a website like this well when it when we started and it I think collectorknives.net came about around 2004, but maybe a little prior to that, my, my buddy, uh, who I talked about previously, he, 
he wanted to move some stuff. He was, he had people come to his house, but he wasn't really personable. And so he, he wanted to, he wanted to move them. He wanted to turn them over so he could buy something else, but he didn't have an avenue for it. And I was doing a little bit of eBay and things like that. So I had some really, really basic, uh, websites and, and I was uh, really doing them on commission. That's how I started just doing stuff on commission for him. We would, we had, create a spreadsheet and, and, uh, he'd send me 15 or 20 knives a week and I'd, I'd sell them and he would, he wrote down what his cost was in them. And he said, you sell them when we'll split it. So, so he would take, you know, if his $10 knife and we sold it for 20, he would take his 10 back and half the profit. And that's, that's where I got started. So I just, I didn't spend a dime of what I was making on it. I just put it back. And when, then I would buy stuff from him, inventory from him. And, uh, and then got started with buying other, you know, uh, other brands. And, but he was big. We were, we were together buying uh, queen from Clarence mm-hmm. Reisner and we were buying, you know, like I say, bulldogs and case plastics from Jim Parker and, you know, and, and always had a, a blue Ridge account. So uh, just kind of eased into it with him. Really. That's where the volume got started is, uh, is uh, just, the guy that I started off partnering with and just accumulated really just like I say, I just, a lot of people go to, go to take their knives, go to knife shows. And if they make a hundred dollars, they go buy a nice supper or something. We didn't, I didn't, I didn't touch it. I just, yeah. if it was enough money stayed in the knife drawer and that's uh and I just built inventory and I learned early on, you could, you know, even if you're just making, 15%. If you can turn that 15% five times a year, it works out, you know, it works out a lot better than just going and buying something and sitting it in a, in an account somewhere. So, uh, Mike, how do you account for the recent and by recent, I mean the last five years or so real, uh, um, sort of resurgence in the interest of traditional style knives and slip joint knives and that kind of thing, uh, from the, the tactical knife and modern knife set. What's that do to? I I don't know. I mean, it's if I were if just pure speculation. I you know a bunch of people my age remember their parents, their father having a knife. You know, I mean, I mean, we used to we used to work cattle, and and my dad started off with a K Stockman, and that's what he mm. worked with. And eventually, we worked enough that he made his way up to you know. Uh, scalpels and or banding he, he, he banded a lot but mm. that's just uh you know i think a lot of people their parents are not necessarily still around but they remember that and yeah. uh and and I, that helped a lot uh 15 or 20 years ago i think now it's just more of uh, a lot of the younger crowd see it as nostalgia i mean it's yeah. just a, a nostalgic yeah. and and a lot of a lot of customers that I've gotten uh, over the last, especially the last three years, but even prior to that, where they got addicted in the moderns, they they love the frame locks and but and just wanted to try something else. I mean, they would just come along and and get something. And that up until I don't know seven or eight years ago, I didn't have anything else. I mean, that's all I did. Hmm. But uh, but all the companies went broke. So yeah, I had to do something else. I had to branch out a little bit. And so we've kind of eased into some of the brands that ended up now making the, the traditional patterns for me that are just, I mean, they're just doing a phenomenal job. The guys, especially in Maniago, I mean, mm-hmm. Viper, Viper line still. Now I'm working with Fox. Uh, oh, you yeah. know, I've done some stuff with Mazarin. They've just, it just amazed me what they could do and they do it completely different. I mean, you know, they, they make all the pieces and then they put snap them together right before they go out the door as opposed to hafting in, I mean, doing it all, you know, like they did a hundred years ago, mm-hmm. but, uh, but we're really run out of places to buy a traditional made traditional. Yeah. I mean, we just, that's, that's where I'm sorry, I'm going to interrupt you here, but, but that you raise an interesting point, the way they manufacture the tradition, uh, these slip joints, we think of the crowned spine on the, on the back spring and on the, um, spine of the, of the blade as a luxury. But really when you look at it in terms of how they're being put together, it's almost a necessity on, un- unless you're going to take the time to haft things down 
and and make them super smooth like the back of a case or something like that mm. that that crowned spine uh, you know when you go to put everything together it's going to fit perfectly it's going to fit much better than trying to get something perfect like that seamless and also it's a luxurious feel it's a different feel when we feel our thumb on that rounded spine it, you we feel like we're getting something extra yeah i mean it it until people start putting a lot of thought into it well they do it this way because of this you know i mean it does simplified it does take some of those places where you can have a, a slip of a, a wrist when you're going through the line it takes some of that some of those variables out but those companies invested i mean and really invested more than they had to invest probably a decade or two ago on cnc equipment and the just modern equipment that you know at the same time we were going with you know our traditional people uh Bill and Bill Howard and those guys were buying up hundred year old equipment to make them exactly like they did a hundred years ago. So it was just a divergent, but they ended up, you know, ended up coming and it just, it just increased your catalog essentially is what it does because there's, you know, they're both great. Uh, the old equipment can't handle, I mean, it can't handle good, the high, high hardness steels. So they mm. can't, I mean, Bill's, Bill's, he won't, he can't even do D2. And he used to do it at Queen, but he just said, he just said, well, when you. You're talking you about Bill Howard with Great Eastern Cutlery. Yeah. 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 He just said, you just destroy so much equipment and you get, mm. you know, little anomalies in the steel. It's just so many have to go out of seconds that you just can't you can't uh, justify it when when 1095 is selling like gangbusters so. yeah and okay let's talk about great eastern cutlery for a second there there is no reason for them to do d2 as far as i'm concerned because like you said you know if you if you make the commitment to a traditional pattern or a traditional way of making things you you take that commitment all the way to buying 100 year old machines and doing it in that old process you shouldn't be worried about d2 you should just stick to the 1095 and make these amazing knives you're making. I mean, I don't think it's, it, I'm not suggesting it, it plays on his mind, but I think what they are doing at Great Eastern Cutlery is exactly what they should be doing. Um, I think they are fi filling a part of this bur re burgeoning traditional market with something that needs to be there. Traditional patterns, uh, modern interpretations of traditional patterns, but still made in that traditional way. Mm -hmm. And then you have companies that you're doing exclusives with at CollectorKnives.net. Like you mentioned, a lot of these Italian companies, um, uh, chief among them so far, Lion Steel. You've made a, a number of like amazingly popular knives with them. Uh, the um, uh, what's it? Um, the 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 groomsmen. I'm sorry. What are the names of the knives you've made with them? Well, there's the the Barlow comes in three three shapes: the Shuffler, yeah. the Dom, and the and the, the uh, Roundhead, and then the Two Blade Warhorse, and uh, and then Viper's done the Easy Open, and uh, the uh, Sal Belly is the newest one they've done. Ooh. But Alliance still also did the what we call the Bolus, and that come from the old days of working the Kevs. Nobody can figure out what Bolus stands for. And, they look it up and they say, well, that's what an owl hawks out when it gets a fur ball in its mouth. That's what it gets. <laughs> when you look up the definition, that's what it is. But to me, a bolus was the pill like this big that you take a shooter and you shoot it down the cow's throat as when you're doctoring them in the, in the head gate. So it's a so it's a perfectly rounded, you know, it's just got a shape to it. And so that's what on the bolus, I dropped the drop the tank to where you didn't have that back end uh, sticking up and. And so that's just, I thought, well, that'll, that'll fit. So, so you, you didn't have this little thing here. That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. We got the, so, sit from. is your bolus in, is it an equal end opposite end Jack kind of? Oh. Oh. So you don't have your back here. You see your, the tangs dropped. So you don't yeah. have a tank. So it's come, this one's, this one's the, the drop point. I have clip. And then mm. the one I call the ot nat because, uh, just to play on words, it was essentially a reverse tonto, kind of like the Benchmade 940, I think, but it's reverse tonto. So I just reverse tonto and called it the hot nap. But uh, <laughs> that's uh, funny. So, you, re but, you reversed the word. Yeah, gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. So, and we're right now, we've got three or four in the works. Uh, you know, so there, I mean, I, there hadn't been a dud yet. And it, uh, 
a company my size, I mean, I'm, I'm it, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm the company. So yeah. it's when you start doing new patterns and you're setting out 40 or $50,000 on a pattern, you better hope it sells pretty good. Yes. And some do, some don't, you know, and, and even though they're good knives and people love them, you know, it's, you don't hit those bar lows very often that, uh, that, that series with line steel has been, you know, it's, it's, it's really saved us because we lost, you know, we were, we lost Shrade, we lost Camillus within, you mm. know, and, and with, and with those two, we lost more maker. They couldn't get anybody to make their knives. And I used to sell a bunch of them and, uh, you know, and we're, and so you, we just lost so many good makers that, uh, you know, we had to find something and, and, and great Eastern couldn't make enough. I mean, they, yeah. you know, there was a day where Bill would call me and say, Hey, you need anything made, you know, mm. and now it's now he's just completely quit doing it. So, uh, I mean, there was, you know, we did some crazy stuff back 12 or 13 years ago. I was, I was digging through a go and I, most people probably have never seen one of these, but it's, it's the oh. old 23, but I'll open it up here. They're doing a run of 23s right now, right? Yeah. But if you can see it, it's oh. got liner oh. locks here and it's wow. got two, the liner locks split both ways. So it's a double liner lock and and uh, most people have never, never seen that. So, uh, you know, but that's one thing he just, I come up with the idea and he said, Hey, you know, if you want to try it, we'll try it. So God. we tried it and you can't even, I've got a, I've got a garage full of this nice feathered Buffalo horn and he won't touch it anymore. Oh, I thought you were going to say you have a garage full of those knives. I was going to say, no. I have an audience full of people who will buy them <laughs> from you right now. No, no, but, I wish. I think that's the prototypes. The only reason I still have it, but, God. uh, but he, he quit me on like of most of the stuff I got. He would wait until I got it. And then he would say, yeah, I'm not doing that anymore. Buffalo. He, he hates horn. He hates any kind of horn. So, Well, let me ask you about the process of working with a company. We'll, we'll take the Dom. Uh, the Dom is your, uh, it's a sheep's foot, right? That's the sheep's foot Barlow. Mm -hmm. it's got, yes. All right. So tell me about the process of designing and having that made with line steel do you design it soup to nuts and then send it to them how does that whole process work when we first started like the barlow it was i essentially wanted to tweak the great eastern number 77 so we were doing that with great eastern they they had got in heavily in the north woods and so they were doing a lot of stuff for Derek, and so they were doing less for a lot of other people and so we we got into that because out of necessity, just because the Barlow was a craze that, that mm -hmm. I wanted to have a, a better steel, uh, you know, get some titanium. And it was really, I was trying to reach because I was already selling some modern folders and I was trying to bridge the gap a little bit and just get, get something that both crowds could kind of, and, you know, appreciate and, uh, and might move them one way or the other. I mean, I have a lot of modern people that say it's got them into, slip joints and i got a lot of traditional guys that say that's eased them into some modern stuff mm. so that was the that was the goal and it was it's gangbusters i mean it we, they were crazy the the marlows did did phenomenal they're still doing phenomenal i mean we've come out now with one they call we call the slim which has no liners it's just titanium or mm. carbon fiber or, or you know and, and just the blade so it's a slimmer it's a lighter model we're we're trying to design a uh a new version of the war horse, which was the two blade. And it's, uh, uh, we're trying to get all the fittings and everything right on it. And it's a, uh, calling it, you know, it's like a beer low. So it's, uh, Oh, uh, nice. Yeah. Spear, spear main bottle opener, uh, cap lifter secondary. And, uh, but, but to answer your question, the, so the originally I would just take two or three knives that i love things about them and i would make a drawing and and then show them the knives or send them the knives and say hey can you do this but do that change this change this and and so here recently i've just and i'm i'm not a cad guy i'm not a i mean i come from a technology background but i can't do that kind of stuff so mm -hmm. i just literally get a pencil on a piece of paper and erase it 50 times and and then scan it and send them that and uh and for the most part i it would be it would be silly of me to take a lot of credit on the design because those guys once you give them something and give them an idea 
they will take it and turn it into a piece of art. I mean, they're just, that's what they do. And they're, right, right. they've done, they did it then. And, and you know, I, I don't know when the modern traditional craze started, but we were doing this in early 17, I think probably early 2017 mm -hmm. is when we started it. And we were, I remember being at blade and I don't remember if, I don't remember if the Barlow, if the Barlow had come out or if it was just about to come out. And I saw this stupid proper and I thought, oh, man. <laughs> All right, we're going to get to the proper. <laughs> yeah, they beat me. They beat me by like a few weeks to the market with a, with a traditional, you know, with modern traditional, you know, slip joint. So, but, uh, but anyway, no, it's, it's been great. The line still loves it. I mean, they're enjoying it. And I, I don't, I've gotten, I've gotten in trouble uh, exporting shipping out and so i just don't ship out of the u.s anymore okay and uh so we i have an arrangement with flying steel and and i i they make them for me they make them to my order but they make extras for themselves and i sell here and they sell everywhere else so all right so you brought up the proper and i want to i want to ask you um so in my in my collection i have three uh modern slip joints i have the um uh Gitano, which I think is absolutely beautiful. Uh, looks like a traditional Spanish Navaja to me, which is one of my favorite uh, shapes overall. O overall. <clears throat> I have this um, <clears throat> Medford Gentleman Jack, which I came into, uh, which is an interesting knife. And then uh, I have this proper, which I got because I had a, a dividend at REI and bought it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, I took it apart. And since I took it apart, put it back together, it's much better. But I I'm curious what you think of modern traditional knives. Of the three I showed you, um, this this is kind of the most modern. It's it's like a Medford, you know, a titanium knife, except without a, a lock. This one is the most traditional in that it's a slip joint and looks like a Navaja. And then you have the the middle of the road here. And you called it stupid before. And I think you were just saying it was stupid because they came out like right before you. But what do you think of these modern patterns and modern incarnations uh, as opposed to, you know, the more GEC traditional way of doing things? I, I mean, you can't go wrong with them. They're a good gateway. I mean, they're, they're a, you know, they'll draw people from both sides uh, and they'll, they'll move people from side to side that, I mean, but you, I'm terrible at judging stuff. I mean, when uh, Gianni uh, is lying still at Blade, he handed me the Gatano, the prototype Gatano, and uh, and I I opened it up and closed it and several times, and he's he, he's looking at me and smiling, you know, waiting for me to say something, <laughs> yeah. and I didn't want to say anything because it was going to hurt his feelings. I could not stand that knife, and I, I, first of all, I thought. I thought you've really burred up the closing because it's almost in, uh, impossible to close. And so then he, he, you know, he showed me what it looked like a, a part and, you know, the mechanism and well, okay. So I'm <clears throat> still not a monster fan of the Gatano. I sell mm -hmm. them. I, you know, I enjoy them, but uh, it's, you know, it's, 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 you're drawing a crowd. There are people that love that knife, love that yep. style of knife. And yep. especially the Europeans, they love, I mean, they really seem to have, have taking a hold of that knife and and so they're all they're all you know that one's the only one that i would even call traditional because it's on one looks like a traditional pattern right. of the ones you're talking about but right but any you know a slip joint is you know it's nostalgia i mean you, if you're going to buy a knife that you're going to take out and work all day with it and don't want to worry about cutting your fingers off you're probably going to get it from liner lock or frame lock when i go out to you know, when I go out to cut stuff like that, working where I don't have to pay attention to what I'm doing, I'm just grabbing it with one hand and doing, you know, trying to get some work done one handed. That's what I grab. But mm -hmm. when I'm going anywhere else, going to one of the kids' basketball games or something like that, I, I drop a drop a slip joint in a in a leather slip and put it in my pocket and go. So. Well, for lucky men like you and me, uh, it is nostalgia, but for most of the world, it's actually necessity because mm -hmm. in a lot of places, well, like you were talking about Europe and where Lion Steel is based in Maniago, uh, they can't have locking knives. And so um, they're dealing with a whole different, um, you know, whole different situation. And, you know, I look at uh, uh, now, you know, many, many companies like Real Steel, they have a number of slip joints and, 
and uh, they're designed by cool designers like Ostop Hell and other folks, and and they're looking cool, but they look like modern knives that are that are um, that are just kind of fitting into the non-locking paradigm just for legal purposes, and mm -hmm. and to me they they're not they're not the full deal because they don't they don't tap into that traditional um, design, and so for me a lot of that has to do with materials uh, these traditional style these these folders are so addictive because of their covers um you know these jigged bones are so beautiful and all these other materials when you're designing a knife with lion steel and you know you, like the barlow series for instance how do you figure out what covers to choose and how does that whole part work well the the first time you just have to kind of go with what you're noticing the market is looking for so you just uh I'll, you know, you've always got to have a wood. You've always got to have uh, some kind of horn if you can. And then, and uh, that'll kind of keep your traditional guys hooked. And then you've got to have, you know, some kind of carbon fiber or micarta and, uh, and kind of, I mean, like I say, it just, it, it moves people from one place to the other. And it, and it, uh, you know, you just, that's the one thing is a lot of the current slip joint makers don't do, things that will get them in trouble or cost them a lot more money at the border. I mean, you do horn, you do things like woods, even coca bolas, ebony's, things right. like that. They cost you, they cost you time and money at the border. I mean, fish and wildlife, you know, FedEx turns it in fish and wildlife sees ebony on an invoice and it's going to cost you, I mean, it's going to cost you two weeks and, and an extra hundred and $150. And, you know, so a lot of people just, and, and, a big there's a big market for titanium i mean everybody wants mm -hmm. titaniums and micartas and those type deals so it's i do it because that's where i come from i mean we didn't buy you didn't have a lot of case stockmans with uh you know titanium <clears throat> handles so. so i actually i want to um double back to the stockman because right now it's one of my favorite patterns and i'm noticing a sad lacking of them in my collection i need to change that in the month of december i'm not buying any new knives in november uh but uh um you mentioned before your father carried a case stockman on the ranch or, or on the farm and uh and then you said and then you, we went to banding and and i think what you meant is for castration you you started putting rubber bands and and that around the testicles and that, that gets rid of them instead of using the spay blade. I just want to talk a second about the stockman pattern and the spay blade and the trapper pattern, because that, that also features the spay blade. Actually, what seems to be a more realistic blade size for the task, but let's talk about the spay, spay blade for, for a minute. What is that for? And why is it still on modern, uh, on, on traditional knives that we buy today? Well, I, the, the main function for it, uh, for the, uh, the original intended purpose was a lot of times you're working in the blind. So you can't have something that's going to be sitting there jabbing and you're in between two legs. So you've got, you can't have a tip on that thing. that's going to be cutting legs and, and, they, and they don't like it. So they're, they're jumping They're I mean, they're, they're yeah. trying to get away from you. So yeah. if you have something that's going to poke, you're just going to destroy your calf. So, uh, I mean, we, he used the stockman. He also used the trapper, the spade blade in the trapper. Mm -hmm. You know, if you, if you need the length and, uh, I don't know how he kept from cutting his fingers off because we would sit there. We would, at the time he was, he was trying to, I mean, he was working himself to death, but we would bring in cattle from like Kentucky to Oklahoma. And we wow. just, a just a, 18 wheeler full of 500 pound bull calves and we'd work them right off the truck. And so we'd sit there for two days and just work them, you know, doctor them, give them shots, dehorn them, brand them and castrate them. And, uh, and, and so that's what he used. He used a trapper. And then after we got into the feed store and some more, you know, then the banding guns came around. And so it, it eventually what he did was he would go catch a cow as soon as she dropped a calf he would check it if it was a bull calf if it was three hours old he'd just put a band on it and never have to worry about it again we he got uh it's not a funny story but it's a story <laughs> as, yeah. as nick would as i guess as nick would say but uh, uh we were working them one day and we'd we'd 
my job was to put the boards behind the calves as they got into the chute so that they couldn't kick. So you'd put one down a couple of foot off the ground and then one, you know, up higher. And then dad would, he would be in the chute behind them working from the back and about a 500 pound, uh, we always call him a stool, but uh, because he got one, he got him half cut and the thing jumped straight up and kicked straight down oh. and took out the whole the whole left side of my dad's face. Just oh, crushed my him, God. All of his teeth. And and so that was that was kind of the end of the the, you know, we're doing it by blade for Jeez. him because he just couldn't he couldn't have took one of those again. And so. And it, I mean, he had his wire, his mouth wired shut for weeks. I mean, I just, oh I remember he, he, he got so hungry for a hamburger and shake that he had mom put a shake in the blender and then drop a hamburger <laughs> in and, and purify it because the doctor had knocked out a tooth so he could stick a straw through a tooth. Oh, and uh, God and that's him. what he, that's what he had drink when he was, uh, when he was dying for, uh, for his normal, uh, redneck meal. But, uh, but that was kind of the end of the, the cutting them, you know, and, but I've, I've seen a lot of crazy things on a farm. <laughs> so, so really, yeah, geez. Uh, so, so I wanted to bring that up because the, apparently the most common form of slip joint knife is the trapper. You've got the regular clip point, but there's always that funny looking butter knife thing. And that's what that's mm -hmm. for. That's a spay mm -hmm. blade. doesn't have a tip. So you're not stabbing into anything while you're spaying the animal. And uh, I, I thought that was, I thought I thought that was uh, incredible to to find out. I mean, all of these knives, you know, I I, I recently uh, got into um, Rough Rider knives so that I could check out all these different patterns for cheap. You know, what's a sunfish all about? Okay, I'll buy a fifteen dollars sunfish and just have it. And uh, um, you know, heaven knows I'd love to have a GEC sunfish, but I I think you know you have to come across a leprechaun or something to, to, to get into something like that. So uh, my point in saying that is that every pattern, every traditional pattern has a reason for being and has uh, a distinct history. And to me, it, that is very interesting. Um, the sunfish, for instance, uh, from what I know was meant to be batoned through rope with a, with a mallet, but, was actually mostly used by Midwestern electricians. I mean, that that's what I've learned. And there's, you know, there's, it's kind of hard to get this kind of information on this, but um, I mean. Yeah, some of, some of them too are, are, if you look at really old knives, I've seen some that not, and just have to ask people and, and they have a lot of the older gentlemen's knives have like button hook blades. I mean, that's how they would stick it through their shirt or whatever, whatever they did and pull the button through. And so oh. I, you see a lot of button hooks. You list, I mean, I've seen, I've seen things. I like, what in the world is that for? And it's something that it's like the buggy whip. I mean, what, you know, why would you, it's right. a lot like, a lot like great Eastern's latest, you know, one of their latest knives. Why in the world put a, you know, put a comb on a knife? Well, that was a hipster move. That was a hipster well, move, Mike. They were responding to all the, I got to say that was a savvy move on their part because um, first of all, it's totally unique. You've never seen one of those before. A, B, beards are big. Lots of people have beards. And you're talking about crossover knives. Mm -hmm. And there are companies like the James brand, for instance. They're kind of a lifestyle brand and they make knives. You know, they, they're designy and it's fashionable and cool. And to me, this is great Eastern cutlery reaching out to the hipster community. All, all of the beard wearers who, you know, like to comb their beards and such. It's it's the perfect way to reach out to them, I think. I mean, that's what I thought, you know, when I saw that. Because yeah, it's, it's, it's still beyond it, the pill. It was a great idea. It's just, I mean, that's one of those things. It's, I mean, you're putting, I mean, he can do it now because people, they were sold before they were ever made. But, oh, yeah. You know, but you got to be careful when you're making things like that because there was a day where Great Eastern made stuff, even traditional stuff that wasn't out of the ordinary and when they released it, there were crickets chirping. I mean, they, he let Smokey, I think it was Smokey. Somebody told me Smokey talk him into the lady's leg. And then when those come out, you could not, you could not give them away. And That's they funny. sit in inventory forever. Same thing with the canoe. I, I mean, when they announced the canoe, everybody oh. wanted a canoe. They all mm -hmm. died, were dying for a canoe. I was excited about a canoe. And then they come out and I probably stocked canoes longer than any pattern I've ever. Are you kidding? Me? You have any left? No, but no. oh my God, I would love to have a GEC canoe or the lady's leg, by the way. I 
excuse me, I recently got my wife and both my daughter's ladies leg knives from uh, uh, from Rough Rider just to have, and they think they're cute, but I like them too. I mean, I would have one and carry one. It's a neat, it's an interesting part of history. I remember they came out with that when they came out with the, uh, what, what was this thing called? The, the Ben uh, Hogan? I didn't yeah, the it. Ben Hogan. Yeah, this was the Ben Hogan. This is my favorite steak knife. Mm -hmm. And look at that classy cover. I love yeah. that. So what are your feelings on Great Eastern Cutlery? Uh, um, you know, uh, how do they grow? How do they accommodate this? Because when the beer and sausage knife came out and, and the 23, everything that comes out, I, I mean, I, and I'm pretty sure I'm lurking on all the sites all the time and they're immediately sold out. And, and I can't, you know, I do have other things to do. I cannot like hang out by the computer hitting refresh all the time. How do they grow? How do they keep up with demand? I don't, I'm not sure that he wants to try and fill the gap. I mean, I, because, I mean, he would love to make as many as he could sell every time. The problem is he's been around long enough to know that you can't hire double your staff and then maybe the election doesn't turn out like you want and the market crashes and, and nobody's got expendable income and now you've got 30 extra families that you're responsible for. So, yeah. I mean, I think he, I think he had in his mind originally, or at least he's, he rethinks it every few years to how many knives a day do I want to make? And, and then he staffs to that. Now, I mean, he's up 50% probably from seven or eight years ago. There's a long time. They ran with 20 people, 21 people. It's got 30, 31 wow. now, but he's having problems keeping them because, you know, it pays more a lot of times to not work, uh, as, with especially that thing that they had through July, you know, where they paid you an extra six hundred dollars. So, and then you got, you know, you just got people that find better jobs. You can't, you can't pay forty or fifty dollars an hour to, you know, and make it work. So, yeah. uh, you're talking. I don't know. I have no idea what his average salary is, but somebody can eventually probably find a little, a little better pay for a little less, you know, work. Yeah, and and, and uh, you have to teach you have to teach everyone how to work on hundred year old machines and, and he, and he teaches them. I'll tell you, that's and, another and thing. Bill will, Bill teaches them. I, I believe it, but that's not necessarily a skill that translates outside of that company at all. You know? Um, so I could see, man. So I think, I think the world of their knives and I think they're such a cool outfit and I hope they never go away. Um, they are, um, they're kind of like a boutique knife, but you know, they're kind of like a small, they're like a very small and exclusive knife maker. And I love them and I love what they're doing. And I love how they're kind of maintaining American knife tradition. And I hope they keep doing it. I, I just hope they just make them just, just a tiny bit more available so that I can get them when I want. Well, I don't, I don't, I don't know if it, I really don't know if it might. I mean, I've seen everything I've seen. I've seen Great Eastern sit with so much inventory at the factory that they it literally had them in a bind. I mean, mm -hmm. I've I've uh, I've pre bought knives before to help the factory make payroll. Okay. I mean, I mean, just, just things like that. So, yeah. so you know, they remember all that. I mean, and you and, and Bill was at Queen a long time, so he remembers that. And they were making Queen was making the best knife made in the nineties. I mean, there was. A lot of people weren't, there weren't near as many people into knives back then, but the Case Classic, the Winchester knives, the reproductions, those were the best knives by far, slip joints made in the 80s and 90s. And Bill was the one making them. So he has seen it. He's seen it all. And, you know, them, you know, it's great during the up times, but you never know when that downswing's coming. And when that downswing's coming, I mean, when you work with people like that, you know their families, you know their wives, you know their kids, you know, yeah. I mean, and yeah. so, to to in your mind to mentally think well i've got to change things so that i can have more staff and the possibility of it being you know a, of a downturn requiring me to then send them out into the cold is a lot of people just don't want to think about that it's i yeah. it's I, I i say this i used to 30 years ago i walked into a casino and i was aggravated because every blackjack table was a ten dollar table and i said can you not open up a $2 table? 
and the, the little pit boss, he said, why in the world would I open up a $2 table when every seat at the $10 tables is full? And it's kind of the same way with, with knives. People second guess him all the time, mm -hmm. but he's, he's where he's at in 2020 because of what he's done up to this point. And I don't agree with it. I certainly don't agree with some of the stuff he's done recently, but I appreciate and respect the fact that he's in hindsight. You cannot, you cannot, uh, you know, say that he doesn't know what he's doing because he's got 30 people, 30 families that he's, making a living for, you know, and he don't want to do this forever. I mean, I don't know how old he is, but he's got to be about burned out because I mean, when you sadly, I'm not a, I'm a behind the scenes type guy. I'm a, I'm a introverted art and, and he's similar. And you just, you, you eventually you burn out of hmm. everybody in your ear all the time. You know, you yeah. love them. I mean, yeah. I, I, yeah. I, I, there's, there's people right now that it would, you know, it just, if something happened to them, it would just kill me. And I've never laid eyes on them, but, yeah. but you just get that, especially these days, because we have, we've drawn in a lot of 20 somethings, you know, and, and they're used to uh, Medford's or Alamics or, you know, they're buying really nice modern knives, uh, CNC knives and, they get in a great Eastern. It's, you know, got a little bit of blade play or it's got a little gap here and there. And, and I mean, I'll just, you just get chewed up one side and down the other. So it's, yeah. Well, that's a, uh, and I'm certainly not picking nits with you cause, but I never find that on my great Eastern cutlery knives. Uh, the only, the only thing I ever find that's, you know, slightly displeasing is, and, and this is strictly a taste issue. Like on this, uh, 98 like i wish it had a strong or 97 i wish it had a stronger spring but that's personal open taste. it but open it back up and open it back up and feel it go into let it let it fly into half stop and feel that feel that that click i mean he there's very few knives you can get that have that perfect of an action in my opinion when you when you do a knife that has a half stop and it over travels half stop just a little bit and then comes back to a salute. There is nothing better in a hand than that. As far as I'm concerned, Bill did it. The the one knife that I hated Congress cause I didn't need four blades, but the mm -hmm. queen Congress, the queen large Congress back 15 years ago, 20 years ago, just, I mean, perfection. And that, that those, there were a lot of them that were lazy and uh, and none of them snapped like a twenty three. They weren't made to snap like a twenty three. No. But if you don't, if you can't make yourself appreciate that action in the half stop, and then uh, then you're right. That's not the knife for you. But it's uh, to me that was nothing feels any better than that. It's just it's not too tight. It's not too loose. It's just uh, you know. And then it's such a big blade though, going all the way open. It's lazy coming all the way closed. It's yeah. Lazy, but it, but when you open it or close it, it stays where it's supposed to be. It so. does indeed. And what a beautiful blade, man. I love the, the titty -ute clip point. I mean, I, I love all of their clip points, but that especially with that mm -hmm. slight recurve, which I believe is there so that you can sharpen through it eventually. And uh, while it's there, it, it, you know, it, it makes the cut better. Um, I want to tell you uh, before I want to ask you about queen cutlery. I want to talk about that for a quick second, but before we do, I want to tell you what my absolute great Eastern cutlery grail knife is. You know, you hear the term grail knife all the time for me. It is the 99 camp knife, the four bladed camp knife with the, I think it's got a big clip point. It's got an all, it's got the screwdriver cap lifter, and then it's got the can opener and the bail, you know, it's like a, a traditional camp knife, you know, like one of these kind of things. And to yeah. me, that is the ultimate Great Eastern cutlery. Oh my God, I would love to have that thing. Yeah, it's if if anybody, you know, I guess you could do it with anything. You could do it with horse races or the stock market or anything. But if I could go back in time, <laughs> buy, because, yeah. because Chris, who was the front office girl at Great Eastern, I mean, when those camp knives come out, she called me asking me if I needed any more. You know, I mean, I just could have bought every one I really mm. made nearly. And there's just, but there's there, those, the stories like that are just, I mean, and I have a pretty good collection. The kids have a good collection, but as far as the stuff that now people are paying crazy amounts of money for, like the, the beer scouts, you know, he, he run those and he run a short run. And I say short run, I don't even remember a thousand or so, but uh, they were so well received 
that within a year, everybody was, I mean, they were throwing a fit because he didn't make enough. Why didn't he make enough? And, and so, so he run them again, in open order, which means he told the dealers, you tell me how many you want. And so we turned in our orders and, and the, if he ever, when he does that, what I do is I just, I take what I think I can sell in a year and I double it. Hmm. And so he, uh, he took orders and he made 5,000 of them stupid. Holy things. And they, they sit around, they sit in stock. I, mean, <laughs> I, I know a dealer. I know that uh, I know one dealer that was selling at least the store models less than a year ago. Wow. Okay. And now they're, they're all thrown a fit because there's not enough beer scouts anymore. So it don't matter. I mean, if he just turned into, you know, great Eastern beer scouts and just, that's all he made. And, and then he went broke. You would still, people would still gripe because he didn't make it. Yeah. Out. Right. <laughs> so, uh, I I've seen recently that queen cutlery is back in some incarnation. What do you know about that? All I know is what I've read online. Uh, I didn't, I, I'd kind of, uh, my relationship with queen soured, uh, after the Daniels took over and, mm -hmm. uh, and so it's just, I just, I was just sending enough stuff back that I finally got a letter from him in the mail. And it said, you know, you're not the, you're not the kind of dealer we're looking for. And I, I just called him and I said, I hey, can, I agree with you. I'm not, but, uh, but you, I got a lot of, I got a lot of factory credit. I need you to go ahead and cut me a check before you cut me loose. So luckily so I was one of the ones that got a, got a check out of the deal before it was over, but uh, a bunch didn't. So, so when you say sending stuff back, is that because it didn't sell or is that because people were sending it back because of shoddy, whatever? It didn't even go that far. I just, I would get in a, I would get in a five digit order Mm -hmm. and and go through them i just had to it got to where i had to go through them you couldn't just put them in inventory oh man and so i'd go through them and i'd have i'd have 20 of one pattern and it wouldn't even the blade wouldn't even close you know and and just things like that and it just you just i mean it was just too bad to sell i mean i would I, what happened was they got so bad that the last batch I bought from them and I'd quit, I'd kind of quit them for a while because the quality was bad, but then I'd saw their dealers saying how great they were. You know, it's, mm -hmm. I, I always tease. It's kind of like, Oh, Oh, what was his name? Rat man or whatever on uh, fast times at Ridgemont high. He's, he's giving advice and he says, yeah, yeah, whatever yeah. you're doing is the thing to be doing, whatever you've got. Yeah. Is the thing to have. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, there was dealers doing that to me. You know, they, you'd see them doing a review and oh, this new queen trapper is phenomenal. And, good. and so I, I, <laughs> got back you know, called them up said hey you know and so got a big order in and i mean is it is a good order for me and i had to go through every one of them and i ended up having to grade them out and charge by the grade so oh, dude if, if i had terrible. if if i had 10 trappers of exactly the same thing i'd have three three a's three you know three b's two two c's or whatever down to and i've said you know a is a good knife and all the way down to, I don't remember C or D is something that should have never left the factory. And, and when I did that and they spotted that, then uh, I didn't make a big deal out of it, but mm -hmm. I wasn't going to, I wasn't going to sell them as at the regular price uh, for what they were. And so when they spotted that, that's when he pinned his letter to me and, yeah, it's 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 kind of like mm, you're a little bit too discerning for who we're looking for right now to represent us. So please get lost. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But that, uh, well, that's what I was I was ticked. I, I mean, I thought it was funny because the wording was you're you're not the type of dealer we're looking for. And I, I just told him, I said, I, I couldn't agree with you more. We're looking for blind dealers who can't <laughs> feel with their hands. Um, so I, 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 I think that uh, it's, you know, it's always tricky when you're talking about, I mean, for me in my collection, I have a number of high-end USA made modern knives. And then I have a number of high-end um, uh, production um, uh, slip joint knives. And then recently, like I mentioned to you before, I've, I've delved into the Chinese made rough riders to try out patterns like sow belly, for instance, before I start chasing down a case, like an old case or an old, Remington sow belly. I want to see if I like it in hand. And that's always been an argument that I never quite uh, resonated with when it comes to um, copies. You know, you'll, you'll, you'll see people online say they, they can get a hold of a, a copy of a, of a knife, a, a counterfeit. Oh, and I'm just buying it just so I can see if I like it or not. 
What? What's? Let's just talk uh, b- before we wrap up here about your view of the knife market in general and kind of how it's grown. It to me right now, it seems like a huge, massive marketplace with millions of ideas going around and lots of opinions. And that's because I'm so heavily steeped in it. But from your from your perspective, uh, where where is the knife world right now? Where has it come from, and where do you see it headed? Well. I don't know. I mean, to be honest with you, I don't have that much foresight into it. I don't, I don't pay much attention to it other than uh, it's becoming, a, there's a lot more people trying to make money on the peripheral, on the sides of it, like YouTube or, or, other, you know, or cloning or, uh, you know, just importing, you know, finding new makers. I mean, there's some great makers that, you know, JE and things like mm-hmm. that, but uh Though that's one thing I, I love about your the podcast is you are actually gathering a crowd all the way from people that have not even yet decided they want to collect or they want to start seeing what's out there and putting their hands on some all the way up to people that have been doing it for you know decades. I mean, they just it's enjoyable both ways. And and they they can, you know, the new guys can learn and the older guys can, you know, learn or or help or whatever too. So but uh I don't know. It's just, I, I really wish that, you know, social media has made it and it's, it's damaging it because, mm-hmm. you know, a lot of, there's a lot of social media that they either, they just want somebody to hear them. So they, they scream things and, you know, want to say things or they're just trying to find a way to make money, you know, reviewing or doing this or doing that. But as far as the knives in general, uh, we're flooded. I mean, we're just getting flooded. That's why, I mean, you just have to find a niche, you know, and I, that's kind of the niche I'm focusing on is a I'm great Eastern's oldest, oldest dealer. And so I've got a good relationship with them and B I've kind of the first one to talk to these, these guys that have the CNC and the new technology equipment into making traditional knives that look like a traditional knife, but under the skins, they're, you know, about as modern as you can get. So, uh, but that's, as more people do that, that's the market, the market's going to expand in my part of it's going to go away and already started. So, uh, I mean, I'm to be honest with you, I had a career and had a great career and enjoyed it. And then when we moved back here, I'm just, I'm doing it because I'm a knife junkie. I mean, that's just, that's what it boils down to is I just, I mean, if, if I go a week, if I go on vacation, I'm aggravated because I don't have a box to open. And it, it's silly <laughs> because it's silly because as I mean, I'm, I can't keep them, you know, I can, I, there's very, you know, if you keep, if you keep one knife out of, you know, out of 10, you're losing money. So I just, you can't keep them, but I still love them. I mean, but that's, I go through my vault every every few weeks and just find some stuff that I've set back for me and just not, not going to do it anymore. And so I just, I call and move them to the website. And, and to be honest with Jim, you, stop right there. I've, I've got more, thank you. I've got more stuff in inventory probably that's not on the website. Than I do that is. So it's just, I've buy collections of the older stuff, but we've killed the market and the older stuff, you know, hen and roosters are phenomenal knives if they're yeah. made in Germany, but now that they're not made in Germany, a lot of times, people don't know especially oh. new people they don't know which ones are which and so yeah. they just won't buy any of them so and they don't come with an edge on them uh i i got it i i i'm sorry jim can you go back to that so i didn't realize you're you are making a sow belly that viper knife sow belly mm-hmm. that looks awesome yeah. i'm that's a pattern i'm 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 partial to at the moment and mm-hmm. thank you jim oh he's putting it up there just to tease yeah. me because i'm in no new knife november so i will not have that knife this month unless uh you know, unless the angels drop it from heaven. Uh, but uh, about uh, your knife collection, how much do you, I mean, so you're in the perfect position, Mike, you get knives coming in, you get to experience them, you get to live with them for a short period, and then you send them along. And really, like, I feel maybe 25% of my knife collection might be like that if I didn't have to buy it to experience it in the first place. Mm -hmm. So um, as we wrap up here, tell me about your collection and what you decide to keep in your own collection yourself. 
these days I don't keep very many knives. I mean, if I get, if I get something come through and there's just a, you know, a phenomenal stag, great Eastern stag and something that I'll, you know, I'll sneak it into a drawer or something <laughs> like that. But as far as, as far as just hoarding them, like I used to, I, I just don't do it. I mean, I've, I'm hoarding them because I've got them, you know, like I say, I've got vaults that I hadn't even put on the website yet, but they're, they're not like I'm in the back of my mind. I'm thinking I'm going to keep those or something. Right. So I mean, to be honest with you, I want to disperse them. And then sadly, a lot of them find their way back either. You know, I have collectors, these, you know, 70, 75 year old guys that collect and collect and collect and buy stuff and buy stuff and buy stuff. And then they pass away and their wife calls and says, Hey, my husband gave mm. me your name because he says, you're the guy that can use these. And so they'll show back up or, I mean, it's, it's, the kids, the kids, I build my kids collections out of stuff. It's funny enough that a run of 77, last run of 77s I did on the Barlow's, you know, of course they were all sold before I ever got them, but I had two or three people that said, yeah, this just really isn't for me. Can I send it back? Said, yeah, <laughs> yes. yeah, you can send it back. <laughs> Cause I don't, I don't have the guts to try and keep one up front because you're right. If you keep one, you're holding it out of one of your customers hands. Oh so, yeah. Yeah. But when, you know, three weeks after a guy gets it, he wants to send it back. I said, heck yeah, you send it back yes, or, or, or great Eastern or great Eastern or Bill will call me and he said, Hey, I, you know, I run out of slabs for this one. Do you care if I put this on it or that on it? And I said, no. Yeah. So, you know, two or three weeks later, I'll get a knife that's got a handle on it. That's one that no one else has ever seen and will ever yeah. see. Oh, and I used to do that. Chris would call me 10 years ago, 12 years ago. She'd say, Hey, we just test ran five different uh, acrylics on this pattern and you know d do you want them and i'd say send me everyone you got so yeah uh, we, sure. i just i just wrap them up and i was gonna say before you oh uh yeah. nick you had nick on the yeah. other day and uh i was gonna nick say Birdvis, you. i mean you're talking uh, uh nick nick timson of birdvis yeah yeah oh, God, that's beautiful mammoth a mammoth dom there and then and then i'd come across some uh olive wood from uh the uh, Garden of Gethsemane. And oh so my God! Him. And uh, so he made me. It's it's uh, Macarta, and then uh, Garden of Gethsemane ivory. I mean, uh, olive trimmings. Oh, no so way. it was. Uh, he's the guy does phenomenal work. If anybody, I mean, his his knives are phenomenal. If you can talk him into doing stuff, uh, custom so you, work on. So you had Nick Timpson of Birdvis Knives do those two handles for you. So, mm -hmm. Wow! Yeah. I know back, he's back not when he was. That. Back, yeah, back when he was doing it, uh, I had him do the olive one and then just here, you know, not terribly long ago, I don't want to get him in trouble, but yeah. not terribly <laughs> long ago, uh, I had the mammoth and I said, Hey, man, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll trade you a couple because you sometimes you get a return because it's got a crack, you know, a little pin crack or something. I said, Hey, I got a couple that don't have slabs, you know, I'll trade you or whatever to do this. And he's, you know, he says, Sure. But I'm the guy's, he's an artist. How did you get the olive wood from Gethsemane? I don't even remember. I've had it for forever, but I just uh, it, there was pen blanks, uh, so they were not they were not big slabs, but you could make you could make two or three knives out of each one, and uh, and I just there's a guy online, and I think it was just like an olive olive wood store, or maybe just a Israel, Israeli. I don't remember, but Would he had Garden of Gethsemane, he had Mount of Olives, and then he had other places and other other things. But uh, I ordered like 50 pen blanks or something and sent them great, sent straight to Great Eastern, and they're still sitting there. And so I, <laughs> I, we never we never put them on anything because at the time there were certain woods that they weren't dense enough to mm -hmm. handle the compound. When you polished compounded uh, olive wood, that black would get it would get embedded. So right. and all you see stores. a lot of, a lot of woods that they do, they won't, they'll satin finish them. Now they, they, he's got a new, he's got a new technique to where he can satin finish them. And so like the iron wood and things like that, he's just got to where he likes satin finishing it. Like so he doesn't have to worry about the compound. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, as we wrap, I know I've said this a hundred times, but I could talk to you all day about traditional knives. What's next for you and Collector Knives in terms of uh, what kind of exclusive are you working on? What can we see come down the pike from you? Well, we've got uh, Fox is working on a three and a half inch gun stock for us. Oh. So it's just clip point, your standard gun stock. Uh, Line Steel is working on a swing guard. 
for us, which is one of the things. It's it's boom, it's boom or bust. I mean, there's, you know, swing guards are kind of a niche, and so you either like them or you don't. But we're trying to make the blade big enough to where it can be like a mini hunter. So you need the lock back and you need the guard. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's they're they're working on that. They're also we're starting to work on that the beer low that I the mentioned beer low. earlier. We're not very we're, we got a lot of work to go there and and viper. Uh, Viper is working on. I just went blank. What is Viper working on? The right now we're finishing up the the sow belly. The, no, <clears throat> yeah, the, the the we did another run of swaybacks because blade forms. We did their traditional twenty twenty oh, knife nice. is is a Viper swayback. But uh, I don't know. I don't know where it went. I just went blank on what they're what the actually the next project is. With them. well, but, and there you go. That's the perfect uh, segue into check out collectorknives.net. Uh, you know, on this, on this podcast, everybody knows uh, who listens. I've been, I've been on, uh, I've had a, I've, I've, I've had the hots for the, for the slip joints again lately. And I uh, just can't stop talking about them. And uh, Mike uh, collectorknives.net has been such a huge part of my collection so far in helping me acquire uh, what I love the most GECs, but you have so much, uh, I mean, this, I got the Gatano from your website. You have so much, so much more all of these really uh great uh, exclusives you're doing with lion steel and uh so i i mean i want to thank you for helping enable people like me who just want to get their hands on as many awesome slip joints and traditional knives as possible of course there are a lot of modern knives on your website as well but uh, uh you know i told you why I, I come to you so mike latham thank you so much for coming on the knife junkie podcast well i appreciate you having me and uh yeah, I, I, I do it because that's, I want to get them into people's hands. I mean, there's, you know, there's money in it, but that's not, that's not what motivates me. So, but I, I do appreciate you having me on and uh, I'll be tuned in every week. Oh, awesome. Thank you, sir. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Are you looking for a book about knives or knife collecting, knives and self-defense, or the yearly knife Bible filled with hundreds of pages of information and pictures about your favorite knives? Shop at thenifejunkie.com slash books for your traditional favorites, new books about knives, and the yearly knife Bible. Get your favorite knife book and support the show at thenifejunkie.com slash books. God, Jim has such an awesome radio voice. Love that voice. Uh, so yeah, check out those, those uh, knife books, knifejunkie.com. Awesome. Well, that was uh, Mike Latham, collectorknives.net. I uh, absolutely stalk that website on a frequent basis. And I'm so happy I finally got to meet Mike. Uh, I used to watch his videos when he was putting them out kind of on the regular uh, when new knives would come in. And uh, he impressed me with his knowledge. And uh, well, you know, having him on today was, uh, was outstanding. Uh, really, I mean, this is a guy who loves knives, who grew up on a farm, on a ranch and had real use of them. His father had real use of them. And now he's spreading that love. And like he said, he just wants to get them in people's hands. And I love that. If you, if you have not uh, considered a traditional knife because you are a tactical guy or you're an EDC guy um, and don't think much about non-locking knives, go to collectorknives.net. Just check it, check it out. Look around a little bit. Definitely check out some of, uh, some of their exclusives with, uh, with lion steel italy they are outstanding knives and uh might be just the right civilizer you need for your knife collection in any case i want to say uh thank you to jim as always working his magic behind the switcher making things look great here and also i want to thank mike latham for coming on and classing up the joint uh so for bob demarco which is me i'd like to say thank you very much for joining us on the knife junkie podcast Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, thenifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at thenifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on thenifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at thenifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at thenifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487 and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Podcast.